No. But can you hear me? Uh, well, I don't know if every one of you have Bibles because you actually gonna need them. And I will need help of six volunteers because we will read the Bible. So can yeah, can you help me with this? Yeah, small papers. I don't yeah. No, uh, we I will tell you the number of them. Okay. Can I on those two uh, teachings of each book. And can we go to the next one? So just to have a little bit of context, they, as I told you, they were written in different times of the Bible, uh, of the, yeah, the history. And you can see that after Solomon dies and then the kingdoms were split. The, before uh, the people of Israel went to exile, Nahum was prophesizing about Assyria, um, uh, sorry, about Nineveh, yeah, and the falling of Assyria. And then we would jump some like 200 years, uh, and Ezra is after the exile when they rebuild the temple. Just that we have that in mind. Yeah. Uh, next. Yeah. So we will talk about. Justice in Nahum. Uh, the book of Nahum was written uh, in 600 before Christ, and its na that name uh, means comfort and consolation. And as I was reading the book, you can see that the book is really tough about Nineveh. Do we remember why Nineveh was so relevant in the Bible? Where, what, we, where can we uh, read about Nineveh in another book? Jonah. Jonah. Uh, why? Why was relevant in Jonah? What happened with Jonah? God told him to go there and tell him he was going to destroy them. Uh, and why uh, Nineveh? Why Nineveh's destruction was really important? Okay. Well, <laughs> Nineveh. In Assyria. Yeah. The Assyria was one of the biggest kingdoms in that time. Some historians said that it was really important. Uh, the, yeah, one of the largest empires of the time. So uh, God sent first Jonah to tell people of Nineveh that they were not doing good. And at that point, the people of Nineveh tried to come to God, but they went back to the bad behavior. So then Nahum comes and he gives a really tough message. And it was not with uh, the same compassion as Jonah's. It was a bit tougher. Um, that time between Jonah and Nahum was 150 years. So it was a long time. Uh, in the first chapter, he writes a lot of God's characteristics. Uh -huh. So I'll uh, the person who has number one. Yeah, can yeah. you read this? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. The Lord is a jealous and uh, avenging God. The Lord is, uh, uh, is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance <coughs> on his adversaries and keeps wrath 
for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will be no me- will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the da- are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossom of Lebanon withers. Thanks. Uh, so we can see that he's talking about the goodness of God, but at the same time he talks about justice and that he will punish people who are not behaving well. Who has number two? I am. For me, it starts in the middle of the sermon. I have the NIV. It's okay. Ah, okay. He cares for those who trust in him, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end to, of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. So he's talking about protection. He takes care, and he also uh, sees God as a person who protects the oppressed. Mm-hmm. And who has number three? I think I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Thank you very much. I want you to keep that verse in mind because that's what a very important verse. God is our refuge. So he talks about justice in a way that all people can go towards him because he maybe he he will take time because he has different times than our, our time but he will be just and fair with people who are oppressed and the fourth one once again mm-hmm. uh, wait how long shall I read for this year it says 1 12 yeah the verse 12 well now it's we're in verse 8 though. against the Lord, who will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. For they are like an entangled thorns, like junk, drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble, fully dry. From you came one who fought a evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are not at full strength, and many they will be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. Thank you. So in this chapter, he talks a lot about, we could remember, for example, the people of Egypt, who had a big empire, and God also showed his power, and they were oppressing the Jews, they were destroyed. So this is an example of how that was destroyed as well. Uh, At the same time, if you can see the chapter, there is no, uh, maybe they talk about Nineveh, but they there is not a clear uh, word to say that it was only for that empire, but it could be for any kind of empire that is oppressing people. And then in the second one, this is a picture that I found that uh, how they think it was Nineveh. So as you can see, it's really beautiful city. This one, uh, the walls were really tall more or less between 20 meters, 30 meters. So the people of Nineveh write a lot about their city and that it could be really, really hard to get in. Uh, and that was why people thought that Nineveh was going to last forever. Um, also, it, as, we, as we were talking before, Jonas went there 100 years ago. They listened, but they went to the bad ways. Uh, and taking back from the first chapter, there is uh, God is powerful. At the same time, He's a slow to anger, but He's also fair. So after 100 years, God was telling them, "Don't do this. Don't go to the bad ways." And they did it. And He was. I mean, if we think about that, no, I don't know one person today that lives more than 120 years. So. Let's think.
think that if we sin, for example, we could be dead and then the Lord talks again. So, yeah, it was a really long time. I think God was very patient with people in Nineveh. But finally, he decides to destroy. And at the same time, when when he talks about the, the fall of Nineveh, in this chapter, he talks about the restoration of Judah and Israel. Uh, who has number five? And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. Okay. Thanks. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad? And the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this is a prophecy that the uh, city was going to be underwater. Uh, finally, the river Tigris was, grew up that much that the river destroyed the walls, and then the Babylon people came in. So that was a prophecy that was accomplished. And I found an interesting fact. So the city was destroyed, as the Bible said, that nobody would be able to see it. And they found the city till 18, uh, 1860s, more or less. So that was, this was in 600 before Christ. The city was found in 1840 uh, something. And if you have heard the news, especially the last years, ISIS also came and destroyed part of the rest of the city. So it was, yeah, it has been a prophecy that is destroyed. And I, this was part of the news that they found in that time, 1814. Uh, and finally, the third uh, chapter of Nahum. Well, I wait for you. Um, they, uh, also, Nahum explains about Syria's downfall. If we were talking that Assyria was the, one of the largest empires by that time, it was relevant, uh, the downfall. I was trying to imagine what can we compare to today, and sorry yet, but if we downfall talk about Sweden? the US, <laughs> if tomorrow, for mm -hmm. example, we he hear the news of, oh, this new, uh, maybe China and Russia uh, threw bombs to the US. I guess many people will be happy. Maybe others won't. And Mr. Trump? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. But people who are these big kingdoms, we can take that to today, uh, where they oppress people, where there is this unfair world. People will celebrate a lot. So can we turn? Yes. Uh, the Bible in this chapter says that the violence that uh, Assyria was doing to other nations was going to solve their own destruction. So we also can compare that not only for nations, but also for us individually. If we sin and we also are against our brother, our sister, mm. at the end, that will destroy ourselves. But if we go also to the nations part, it says that... Uh, who has verse uh, the number six? Yeah. Are you going to the session of the Lord of Now I will lift the curse mm -hmm. and show all the earth who are naked and Thank you. And seven. Mm -hmm. uh, you also will be drunken. You will go into hiding. You will seek a refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees. With first right picks, if shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eagle. Thank you. So, when he is prophesizing about it, Assyria is going to fall, and all of the nations we will be happy. They won't help Assyria, but instead, they we're going to celebrate that this, the, this empire was destroyed. So, we can see that this, uh, this prophetic book is a, a lot about more than, is not to aware people of Nineveh. Just go back to your good ways. But it's more about this is going to happen. This is a prophecy. And also about social justice. That God is fair and God also is with the oppressed people. Awesome. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and also I want to...
want to talk about new beginnings with Ezra. Do, what do we know about Ezra? Mm. Uh, Ezra, he wrote the book 200, as I told you, 200 years after Nahum. Um, that was the time when uh, the people of Israel went to the exile and they were dealing a lot. That was the time of Daniel also. And then uh, before that, Jeremiah also prophesied that they were, they were going to come back to their land. Uh, and one of the important things, Ezra means Jehovah helps. That's the, the, what Ezra name means. He was, uh, I would consider he was one of the smartest guys by, of the people of Israel. He was part of uh, the uh, um, Pharisees, uh, that group of people who were uh, studying the law. And also history and some anthropologists said that this group of people, especially uh, the, the, the other professional work he used to do, it was so meticulous that they read everything and when they were writing papers and doing historical records, they, they even thought about how bold was the pencil, uh, how they write. So it was a meticulous work. They had to study a lot about statistics, for example, about a history of their people. So it was a, a really uh, mental profession, I would say. So he was really smart. And he was a perfectionist. Uh, and then the first chapter, can we? Yeah. So the first uh, section uh, of Ezra, from the chapter one to the chapter six, is the first people who return. They were led by Zerubbabel. And I, I separate the positive side and the negative side of it. So Cyrus, by that time, was uh, the king. Oh, Babylon? No, sorry. The, the Cyrus. Uh, they conquered Babylon. And then, that was a prophecy also from before that one king was going to allow the people of Israel to go back. So, uh, if someone wa has the eight, uh, number eight. Yeah, eight. Yes. Okay. Um, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Uh, oh, and let each read okay. okay. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the man of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers, houses of, Jer of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. Thank you. So the, this king was very powerful, and he himself allowed the people to go, leading by Zerubbabel, and also he gave them uh, the chance to take all the resources that Nebuchadnezzar had taken to a pagan temple, and that's how they. This uh, time was a, is known as the rebuilding of the temple. That's the positive side. Uh, then when the temple was built, some people who are considered enemies want, wanted to help out. Uh, so if someone has number nine, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, they, they, yeah, the, the people rebuilt the temple. And first of the enemies, that when the temple was rebuilt, uh, they offered sacrifices. But also at the same time, people who were uh, older, who knew how was the first temple, 
they began to, uh, to, to, they were not happy because they thought that the previous temple was better and the God's, and God's presence was there. So, uh, who has nine, number nine? And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures towards the Lord. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the, father, of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound, sound of the people's weeping. And the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. So, this was a very Catholic uh, description of how the elders were complaining and mourning about this new temple, and at the same time, people were happy. And if you think about this also in our lives, we also tend to think that no, the past was better. Um, for example, one Bible text that I really like is Ecclesiastes 7.10 that says, don't think about the past as a more glorious time. If God was, God was really faithful, I think, because he, he accomplished that prophecy so they could come back. They allowed, the, they allowed people of Israel to rebuild the temple and still some people were, yeah, not happy because that temple before was better. And at the same time, some people, uh, when they had the exile, some people stayed there. So when they came back and began to rebuild the temple, there were a group of people that wanted to help out. And this group of people um, had not really good intentions with that. So uh, if someone has the ten. That's Zerubbabel, uh, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of, of fathers, houses in Israel, said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. We alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. Uh, so as they will, yeah? This is a copy of the letter that was sent to Artaxerxes, uh, Artaxerxes the king. Your servants, the men of the province beyond the river, send greetings and now. So as they were not allowed to help out, they were trying to obstacle the building of the temple. And that was the first time, the first uh, people of Israel that came back. And this is the second part of Ezra. So from seven, chapter 7 to chapter 10, Jeremiah, sorry, Ezra was the leader of the second people, of the second group that came back from, uh, from Syria to, to Jerusalem. Uh, can we read the 11? Yes. Here, chapter 7, verse 10. Uh, for Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. So Ezra was already a really smart guy. And what happens here is also the king by that time who has a very strange name, Artaxerxes. I don't know how to pronounce that. <laughs> But he saw in uh, Ezra this really qualified person who had studied a lot, who knew the law, but also who had reflected on the law and who was able to put all this knowledge and preparation into action. So he asked uh, by that time that he could uh, not only teach, he was the person who um, was able to choose the judges, uh, also by that time, they, they gathered many books of the Old Testament, and that time was so relevant for the history of Jews that that was called as the Aramaic Hebrew. So they, they gathered yeah, all these books, 
and that was what the mosaic uh, law and uh, how they built on this uh, system of laws was relevant until Jesus came and the period of Christianity began. So the, 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 what he, it was not only his skills, but also how did he turn that into action uh, was relevant for history and for the people of Israel. And also we have a downside on that time. Um, there was a conflict with some uh, people who were married. And for that, I would like the person who has number 12. Yes. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1 to 4. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. No one born for a forbidden union may enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and with water on, on the way when you came out of Egypt and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor from Theater of Mesopotamia to curse you. Thank you. So since the beginning of the Bible, uh, God was really, God was very clear about purity and to keep their people marrying within the people of Israel. Uh, because also, in, uh, otherwise they would get some customs and religion from other, uh, from other groups that were around the area. And he asked, since that time, to keep uh, pure, marrying with people inside. But by that time, people were married ag again with people who were not from the people of Israel. Instead of in another time, that people would have been killed, the people who were not uh, from Israel. But they decided instead to take out the women and the children who were not uh, you, uh, from the people of Israel, and by that time uh, they took them away. So it was a me yeah, it was a measure to keep the people uh, obeying God and in yeah in purity. And well, we have seen a lot of history right now, and maybe it has been a bit boring, but why is this so relevant today? How can we translate all this history, or all, all this, uh, yeah, ha all this what happened to actions now? I think first, uh, as we were reading, I think one of the most important verses in Nahum is Nahum uh, 1, chapter 1, verse 3. God is good, he's a slow to wonder, uh, but he's also a God that protects people who are oppressed. Um, we can see oppression at that time, but also we can see a lot of oppression today, and it doesn't matter if it's a developed or not developed country, we can see that here, if we just go out of church and see around the area, oppression is happening everywhere. But God is a God that is good, and even if it takes time, it will uh, establish His justice. Both books, I think that's a common point, talk about repentance and accountability. When Ezra is uh, condemning the marriages that are not uh, mixed, he's also doing a very important prayer of intercession and forgiveness. And at the same time, I think uh, in the case of the book of Nahum, we tend to see some people, uh, I mean, it can happen, some people oppress us, we can suffer from oppression, but also we have to be accountable of if we are oppressing someone at some point with our words, but we are, with our actions. Yes. <laughs> so 
Repentance is really important in, all, in, in these two books. And God is a God that is good, as we talk about. Also, I think it's important that we take this repentance every day. We are always sinning. God is good. And also, if we have something that it's uh, a temptation or a weakness in our lives, God is good and he will be slow to anger. But also, he has uh, some ways also to show us that this is not correct. Uh, and he's, he's a uh, just God. And the third one, I think one of the most important learnings of Ezra, as I told you, he was a really smart person, but he also took time to prepare. He was reading the law, he was studying, he was meditating on the law, and by the time that God needed him to act, he did it. And he could uh, be a breaking point at that time in the history of Israel. So, I want to think uh, on your calling. Uh, maybe you know it now. Maybe you are still looking uh, for that. You are not sure. And if you want to have more, maybe help with your calling, you'll have uh, Ed, for example, people from the world that can help you in this um, if you have doubts about your calling. But you have to be prepared. If you know already what's your calling, I invite you to study more your Bible, to be prepared to reflect on that. Because God has his time, and at some point, he will act, ask you to act. And I think we are also, we also have a purpose here. And the way we act can be really important in our time. So are you prepared for that, for that calling? And are you prepared to act? Uh, we, we can pray about that. Uh, and well, I think we can see then these two books as God establishing his justice, but also learning learning about new beginnings and how to act on them. Uh, so let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for all your mercies. Uh, thank you that we are able to read and talk about you and the Bible without uh, suffering, without having persecution here in Sweden. I pray that we can also uh, be thankful for you as a good father, as a uh, merciful God. Uh, I pray that you forgive us if we have failed you, uh, that we can also be wise and turn our eyes upon you. Uh, Lord, I pray for our callings, and uh, I pray that we can be more like Ezra, uh, that we can hear your voice and that we can prepare our hearts for the time we have to act. And I pray for this generation, I pray for every person here, uh, who is gathered today that you will allow us to reflect on you so by the time you ask us to act for you we can glorify your name in Jesus name